we're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the third, third installment in this series on the second coming. Uh, there's not much being said about the second coming nowadays, but I wanted to make sure that we talked about it here in our church. I want to mention as well uh, something very important. There's a crew, uh, there's a, a group that's going to Ethiopia actually tomorrow on a mission trip. They're going to be doing some work there, so I'm going to uh, encourage you to be praying for them. Um, Kebede is a part of the team, and Sandy as well. They have some work to do. And so we lift them up in prayer and pray, pray that God grants them success. Amen? Amen? That the preaching of his word will not return void. Amen? That he attend his work with power. I don't always acknowledge the time. But friends, I have to let you know, it is 1217. Okay? But I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you could just not glance on your phone for a little while. Is that okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask in a very, very special way there, God, that you be with us now. We give ourselves, our lives to you, and we ask that you speak. This is our prayer. We pray from our hearts. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I want to introduce you to a man. I have a picture of him on the screen. You may not recognize him, but the year was 1904. What year? 1904. The place was St. Louis. And this was actually the first Olympics in the United States. St. Louis. They were utterly unprepared to run a race. Len is his name, Len Tanyane. Hopefully I pronounced that. He is uh, a part of, he's from South Africa, actually, Antizo. I heard a double amen. And he came to the States to run this race in the Olympics. Len Tanyane actually came without a shoes on his feet. He was about to run 25 miles barefoot. Can you imagine that? He was, a, he was a marathon runner, and everyone geared up. The number was supposed to be 600 people, but it turned out just being 62, because at this time in 1904, there was a war overseas as well, and many people dropped out of the Olympics. But not Len Tanyane. He wanted to be here to run that race, and he arrived in St. Louis unprepared for the, for the marathon, but yet still dedicated and determined to run. The starting line, everyone was ready. Len Tanyani was ready to run. The race began, and he started running barefoot. Now, Len Tanyani had some trouble, because back then, the Olympics is not set up, it's not as posh and nice like what we see nowadays, right? There's not a, a, a huge stadium. They were running through the backwoods of St. Louis, there were people who did not agree with the idea of the Olympics, and so they would shout to the runners. They would actually harass the runners. Get out of my town, they would say. We don't want the Olympics here. And so they had to endure a lot of things. But something curious happened to Len Tanyani that day. As he was running the Olympics, he actually came in ninth in the race, not because he was barefoot, not because he was not dressed properly, because back then they didn't have running gear. He was dressed in whatever he had, and he was ready to run. But because of a couple dogs. While Len Tanyane, Tanyane was running the race, he came up near uh, 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 someone's house, and there was a, a group of dogs there, and they saw him, and they thought he was a threat to them. And so they chased Len Tanyane, and ran him off course a whole mile. So Len Tanyane actually ran an extra mile in the marathon that day, but still came in number ninth. Those South Africans, <laughs> they can run. Oh, he still came in number ninth, even though he was taken off course an extra mile. Even though he was taken off course an extra mile, he ran 20, uh, I think the, the marathon was 26, he ran, eventually ran 27 that day, 
And, and he was determined to finish the race, and he got to the finish line, and Len Tanyane, his name is now in, in, uh, uh, engraved in history because of his dedication to run the race. Oh, friends, I don't want you to miss this. You and I, our names can be in another race. We can, our names can be engraved in another history because there's another race that is much better than the Olympics. Oh, the Apostle Paul takes up this refrain in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. We actually, it was mentioned in Sabbath school this morning, I was, and I was tempted to say, don't preach my sermon just yet. Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, the Apostle Paul says in verse 1, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnare us and let us run with, what's the next word? Endurance, the race that is set before us. Now earlier, Paul took this idea of endurance and he expanded it. In Hebrews chapter 10, he says this. Um, he says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance, he adds, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the what? Friends, at the end of the race, there is a promise. And Asusa almost preached my sermon too, handing out crowns. There is a crown at the end of this journey. Oh, I'm excited for heaven, aren't you? Friends, I've been running a long time. I've been running this marathon. I'm only 33, but I'm already tired. I can't wait to get there. In other words, Amen. oh, friends, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we need to get to heaven because that's where our dreams will be a reality. That's the place that we need to be. This, this place is not our home. Can somebody say amen? It's not our home. We are but pilgrims here on a journey, and we are running this marathon, trying to get to that place. Oh, friends, I can't wait. I'm excited. I'm excited to get there. But there's an experience because there is a dog for every one of us that can drive us off course. There's a dog for every one of us that can drive us off course. We're running the race and all of a sudden we get interrupted. It's like, wait, this is not a part of the plan. Where did this come from? Something to take us off course and we get frustrated and we, we lose hope, we lose faith. Can you imagine if Len Tanyane stopped running that day? He, his name would not be written down. We wouldn't even know who he is. But he ran. Came in number ninth. It didn't matter to him. He wanted to make sure that he defeated those dogs, those dogs that were chasing him. I grew up, by the way, in Jamaica. And in Jamaica, I remember one day I was chased by, uh, being chased by uh, um, a Rottweiler. Oh, yeah. That's how I got so fast. You thought it was skill and training? No. I was staying with a relative, some friends of mine, and I had gone over to visit and, 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 and for some reason, I went, to the sto I went to the store. I was asked to go to the store, and the, the door was locked, and the dogs were out, and we weren't friends yet. I opened the gate because I thought, hey, I'm welcome here. This is my home. I opened the gate and went in. The dogs were like, wait, what are you doing? And I decided, being young, instead of, Opening the gate and going outside, I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to beat the dog to the door. I started running towards the door, and I realized, oh, I'm not going to make it. And then I'm thinking, what is the quickest thing? What is the quickest way to get rid of my problem? So I actually ran up to the wall and jumped over it, not knowing what was on the other side. I got some bruises that day. There is a dog for every one of us. A troublesome experience as we're on this journey towards the promised land. And friends, you and I have to be careful because there are some scars, there are some hurts that will endure on this earth, but friends, it will be worth it after all. Oh, I can't wait for Jesus to come to set things straight. Daniel had an intense struggle. You see, Daniel had a burden on his heart. He was trying to understand what was the reason for the delay. And that's one of the things that we struggle with. We've been talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ for a month now, and we're still waiting for him to come again. Jude tells us in Jude chapter 1 that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about the second coming, and we're still waiting for Jesus to come. But friends, 
you and I need the endurance because the promise will come. But how do you endure? You see, Daniel had a struggle. Daniel was, was praying. He was concerned because he, uh, by the way, this is another picture of Len Kanyani. You notice he doesn't have shoes on. I don't know if you can see that. No shoes. He inspires me. If you see your pastor running around without shoes, just, you know where that came from, right? But, but, but the, the Bible says here, Daniel had been sick for days because he was so concerned. What, what is the reason for the delay with this vision that he, God had given to him? And, and the Bible says that while Daniel was there, he, was, he didn't eat. He, he had a hard time sleeping. The Bible says, then he said to me, meaning the angel that appeared, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, and what else? And to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come for what reason? Because of what? Because of your words. In other words, Daniel had prayed, and God was responding to his prayer, but notice what else the angel says. The text goes on. My clicker works. Ah. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for how many days? Can you imagine praying, waiting for an answer, knowing that God had answered you before, and the answer came very soon, but now you're going through day one and nothing you haven't eaten, you're stressed out, your anxiety level is rising, and still day two, nothing. 21 days, the angel was held up with the message. And finally, the angel came and said, Daniel, the king of Persia, the kingdom of Persia, which stood me 21 days until something special happened. Michael, Michael stood up. And the wait ended. Michael stood up and the wait ended. Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vis vision refers to many days yet to what is the next word, everyone? Yet to come. It applies to us. The Bible tells us later on um, in verse 21, 20 and 21, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight to what? To do what? The angel fought on his way coming. Now he's fighting on his way back. I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. In other words, another problem will arise, Daniel. In other words, we're in this for the long haul. But Daniel, you need some endurance. Because this marathon is going to take a lot out of you. And friend, you need to run with endurance. Because that's what it takes. Oh, return to fight the prince of Persia. And when I have gone for it, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. In other words, the angel is saying there's a helper, Daniel, for angels. Michael will intervene every single time. Daniel, you may be under Babylon, but Michael intervened. You see, when the three Hebrews were tossed in the fire furnace, Michael intervened. Jesus stood up in the furnace with them. They had to endure that trial, but Jesus was present with them in that moment. Well, friends, when, 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 the, the, all the, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, Jesus intervened. Michael is always involved in the life of his runners. He is so invested in the lives, lives of his people. He will not allow us to be harassed by these dogs for too long. Oh, friends, the Bible goes on in Daniel chapter 12. There the Bible tells us, um, Daniel chapter 12, if you go, go there with me, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says here, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of, what is the next word, everyone? A time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. You see, friends, you think we're experiencing trouble right now. We just started the race. Because there is more trouble in the future. But we can gather hope. Because we read in the book of Revelation that Jesus has a solution for every 
portion of the journey that the church goes through. Let me give you a quick re recap of that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus sees the patience, the perseverance, the battle that the church in Ephesus had to endure, fighting against who, those who say they were Christians and they were not. Jesus said to them, I know your works. I know the battle you have to fight. I know the race you have to run. I know what's going on. I'm not ignorant of your troubles. I know exactly what is taking place in your midst. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus sees the tribulation, the poverty, the imprisonment, and the martyrdom, and the blasphemers that were abiding in Smyrna. And to this church, Jesus says, I know your works. I know what you have to endure, O oh dear Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, Jesus sees the satanic activities in that threatened the faith of Pergamos. He saw the immorality that was creeping in. He saw the martyrs there too. And he said to this church, I know your works. You probably get the gist by now. Jesus said it to all seven churches. From Ephesus to Laodicea, I know your works. I know what's going on. I know what you have to endure. I know what you have to do. And not only did Jesus say, I know your works, he also says, I know exactly what you need as you're trying to endure these battles. But he says, what I have with me to give to you is designed not just for any and everybody. It is designed for those who are overcomers. Those who endure to the end. Can you imagine showing up at a marathon and as you're there in the crowd, one of the spectators, you see a brother running and he, you know he just probably did two miles and you see the, one of the officials running with a trophy to give to him. Hey brother, you did well. Here's a trophy for running two miles out of 26. How would you feel? Do you deserve a trophy for running two miles? Indeed, it's a marathon. That's what you signed up for, right? Oh, friends, you and I have sometimes the same kind of expectation. We expect that we are just going to float our way to heaven. Oh, God, give me the crown, but I don't want the trial. Oh, God, give me the crown, but I don't want the trouble. Oh, God, give me the crown, but I don't want the labor and the intense experience that I must go through. Oh, God, give me the crown, but nothing else. Oh, God, do I get points for just showing up? Oh, friends, there is something important here for us. Jesus says, even though you may go through all these things, I have this on the screen. Can you read this with me? There is not a single issue that faces the church that Jesus is not aware of and that he has not made provisions for. Claim that promise. There is not a single issue that you and I will face that Jesus is not, number one, aware of and that he has not made provisions for. So the trial that is strange to you is well known to God. The trial that is, is strange to you is well known to God, and he already has a plan. He already has a plan. There is a problem now that the church is facing, and I want to bring it to your attention, because there are many people who actually now doubt the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about just, you know, people who don't know much. I'm talking about scholars who are writing books, theological literature, sending it out there, and yet still doubting the validity of Scripture. It crept into the church not so long ago in, under the auspices of higher criticism where the minds of men are placed above Scripture. It comes in different forms. It's cultural criticism or historical criticism where they say Luke, for example, is not accurate because he's not a historian. He's just a physician. <laughs> Luke doesn't understand culture. And can you imagine us modern-day people telling Luke what he didn't know? Listen to what Ellen White says. Listen to what Ellen White says. Um, and by the way, this is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. We don't have time to go to that, but this is really the example of the two groups that we're kind of narrowing down to, those who are proud, those who think well of themselves, and those who actually humble themselves and realize that I have nothing except to be from Jesus. And I want to be in that latter group, not that former. Oh, she says, to many, the Bible is a lamp without oil. 
because they have turned their minds into channels of what? What's the next word? Speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. The work of higher criticism is dissecting, conjecturing, reconstructing, is destroying faith in the Bible as a divine revelation. She continues. It is robbing God's word of power to control, uplift, and inspire human lives. By spiritualism, multitudes are taught to believe that desire is the highest law, that license is liberty, and that they are accountable only to themselves. There was a pastor back in 2014, a pastor in California who decided that he was going to try atheism for a year. He decided, I'm going to try atheism for a year and see what happens. Came out an atheist. And he wrote this. He said this. This is, this is a quote from him. From him. Um, he says this. I am humanist in the, in the sense that I don't believe anyone is coming to save us. We are the ones we're waiting for. And that's not the only one. I have a couple others. Not only is this plaguing our church, friends, it's also plaguing others of the denomination we read here of a supernatural creation of the world. Most scholars outside of Adventism, praise God that there are some faithful scholars in Adventism. Praise God. Can someone say amen? amen. We need to be faithful to Scripture. And you don't have to be a scholar to be faithful to Scripture. Oh, friends, we need the simple faith now. We need that old-time religion. I'm tired of this new stuff. Listen to this. Most scholars don't believe, don't believe in a supernatural creation of the world. They don't believe in the literal Adam as a historical person. There is no fall. There is no miracles. There is no virgin birth, no bodily resurrection, and there is no predictive prophecy. There is no regeneration, they say, no answers to prayers. There is a different understanding of salvation and judgment, and there is no supernatural second coming of Jesus. They believe in something that is called theistic evolution and does not believe that Adam and Eve were literal people, does not believe in a literal second coming or a literal heaven. These are people that are teaching classes in seminaries. What is the result? I'll tell you the result. Notice, this, was, this is a pastor who was, he said, um, this is a, a Methodist pastor who had, who had gone to a seminary and experienced this. He says, I went to college thinking Adam and Eve were real people. And I can't really remember wrestling with that when my Old Testament professor was pointing out the obvious myths, he says, and how they came to be. And I kind of joked at the time that I prayed my way to atheism. But we know how this thing ends. I'm just telling you that there are people who are giving up on the marathon. And I'm here to encourage you not to. We don't want to be in this camp. We don't want to be in this camp. There's a study that was done by the Pew Research. They said in addition to those, who, who, uh, with those with no college experience, those with no college experience, it actually says, are more likely than those with some college experience to believe and expect the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because faith is being thrown out of colleges and universities. And so we're being challenged on every side. But the Apostle Paul says something. We may, we may be hard-pressed on every side, friends, but praise God, Jesus is right there, and he's ready to help us. Now, it goes on. There is more. There's more that could be said on this subject. I'm just going to move on. I want to let you know that at the end of time, there will be just two groups. Those who are proud and those who are humble enough to say, this is our Lord, we have waited for him. And they may be in the minority, but friends, with God, you and I are the majority. Because our God is bigger than our problems. Our God is bigger than those who, who accuse us of believing fallacy and foolishness. I don't want to be wise. I want to have his wisdom and nothing more. Oh, friends, the day is coming when Jesus will set this thing straight. That's what we read in Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. This is where we are. Revelation chapter 22. The Bible in Revelation chapter 22 comes to a place where it, it is the highest point of the text. Jesus had first introduced in Revelation chapter 1 that he's coming quickly. But Revelation chapter 22, he repeats it three times. How many times? Three times. 
Oh, three times. Let's look at it together. Number one, in verse 7, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. If you want to be happy in the end times, be a believer in prophecy. If you want to be happy in the end times, understand what God is doing. There are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. And number one is trusting the word of God. Don't be like those who say there's no second coming. And friends, um, uh, anyway, I was going to say something else. I won't, I won't, I won't. Now, verse 12, John goes on again. And behold, Jesus, by the way, speaking, it's in red. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with everyone with me to give everyone according to his work. Then Jesus adds, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Oh, friends, Jesus began the story. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it was a small whisper that he's coming again, but now, friends, it's loud. It's a crescendo. Jesus is coming again. And I'm excited to see him. I don't care much about the streets of gold, even though that's beautiful. I just want to hug my Savior and say, man, all the stuff you brought me through, can you explain some of that to me? Oh, I can't wait for that day. Now we go on. Um, here in um, Revelation chapter uh, 22 and verse 20, he who testifies to these things, John repeats, says, surely I am coming quickly. And John just responds as a good church member. He says, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Oh, I want him to come. We need not be afraid of his coming. We need not be afraid of his coming. Because, friends, Jesus does not stand against you. He stands for you if you decide to follow him all the way. There's no need to be afraid of his second coming. There was a discussion some years ago that Ellen White had with a young lady. And they were actually talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the, the Millerites were getting too excited about it. And she was like, oh, why are you getting so excited? And, and, and Ellen White responds, don't you want Jesus to come? And she says, no. Well, my son needs to get married. I need to get some work done. And so might as well Jesus just spend a little bit more time. No, no rush, no rush. I have a couple of things to take care of. I was in Indiana. And I remember one time, might have shared the story before, Ben Carson was running for president and Adventism was in the spotlight and we were called in to this wonderful, wonderful, big, spacious room and there were many people, leaders from different de denominations, the Quakers and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Catholics and everyone was around this big table and we walked in. It was three of us and they sat us down at the head of the table because they wanted to grill us about what Adventists believed. And as soon as we walked in, they said, hey, help yourself to a, to a, to a cup. Of, of coffee. And I said, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'll take water instead if that's okay with you. And, and, and say, okay, okay. Well, and then you just see the whispers in the room. Well, you know, they don't drink. You don't drink. And I'm like, it's kind of awkward now. I'm feeling awkward. Like, uh, I mean, okay. All right. So we sat down. It was very quiet. And they said, they, the, their first question was, why are you so hung up on the second coming of Jesus? I wish you were there too, Gary. <laughs> Oh, friends, I had a lot of fun that day. Oh, I explained to them the meaning of it and how excited I am about it. And they said, one of the person actually shouted afterward, you should be a Quaker. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm all set. Thank you. Friends, are you excited for Jesus to return? That's my question for you. And if that's the case, you and I, like the Apostle Paul says, must fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called. And have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And like Jude says, friends, if you're excited about the second coming, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning the common salvation, I found it necessary to write, exhorting you to contend for the faith. You have to endure. Fight it out. Don't let the dogs harass you too much. Run the race. Finish, even if it means ninth place it doesn't matter let us get to heaven together because that is the place we need to be Amen. so jesus is coming soon when the when the marathon finally wraps up friends 
and we get to that place, you and I would have had, we would have, you know, gone through a lot of difficult experiences. Yes, that's true. We might have cried at a number of funerals, but I learned something. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and there's a section in the book, Pilgrim Progress, that really bothers us. It's a section where Christian was at the house beautiful. He was looking towards the, 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 the wonderful mountains that, that were there that could be used to overlook the, the, the celestial city, meaning heaven. And Christian was having a conversation with Charity, and Charity said to Christian, do you see that mountain? That's where you need to be. And Christian asked, how long will it take? Charity responded, longer than you wish, sooner than you think. That statement bothers me because it's oxymoronic in nature. Longer than you wish, sooner than you think. Oh, friends, we've been wanting, desiring Jesus to come for a very long time. But friends, what, the, what Pilgrim's Progress, the brilliance of John Bunyan is saying there, friends, is that you and I cannot function based on how we feel. The experience itself, and this is the beauty, the experience itself will cause you to forget all the pain. So you and I may cry at a funeral now. When we finally get there and Jesus returns, friends, you're not going to remember as you see your loved one. You're not going to remember that day on that, that funeral. You're not going to remember the experiences, the feelings you had. You're just going to be so overjoyed. That's going to eclipse all the pain you've experienced in life. So wait for that day. Don't give up hope. Because he is coming. He is on his way. He is coming soon. You may have had to endure a lot of trials, a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. People may have hurt you, but friends, on that day, you won't even remember it. You may try to remember, but nothing will come to mind. And you will say, as Ellen White said on that day, heaven is cheap enough. Heaven is cheap enough. Well, I wish I could tell you more about the second coming of Jesus, but I think you understand by now that I'm excited about it. <laughs> Let us be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. I want to make an appeal to you because I really want you to think about this. Think it through. What is life worth if you live all of your years only to die and miss out on eternity? What is it worth if that's all you live for? It requires you being faithful, though, friends, if you want more than just this miserable life that you've been living. I don't know about you, but I've been living a miserable life. I mean, I'm a happy person. A friend of mine told me you could never be a police officer because you smile too much. You know? But, but friends, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm being serious here. Let's be serious about Jesus. Our anticipation, let it mature into faithfulness toward him. I want to invite you. I know, I don't know, by the way, let me say it this way. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what things you're holding on to. I don't know what the dogs are in your life that are harassing you, biting on your heel, and you being friendly to them. I don't know what those situations are. I don't know what the pet sins are in your life, in other words. But friends, what I want to do today is to challenge you to give them up and say, Jesus, take full control. Because I want to be there on that day. I want to finish the race. And my greatest joy is that we are all there eating a mango. That we're all there together. If that's your desire, friend, I'm going to invite you to stand. I want to invite you to stand. Make that commitment. Lord, I want to be faithful to you. I commit myself to you. All I have is a broken heart that I want to surrender to you. Please, Lord, take it, make it yours, and keep it that way so that I can be ready when you return. Let's pray. Father, you are coming. The problem is not you. It is that we are not ready. And in your mercy, you have delayed that experience for us because you really want to save each and every one of us. So Father, I'm praying in a special way that you change our hearts and help us to be more capable, able to respond to your will, to your call, and your desire for us to be wholesome and holy. 
We are broken people. But Father, we give you all the brokenness because we know that you are the expert in putting broken pieces back together. So Father, make us ready for your return is our prayer in Jesus' name.